Hang on one second. Just having a little technical difficulty. Give me a second. Okay, you're going to give me a count in to start, right? You got it. Go ahead and count to five and then start. You ready now? Are you? Yep, I sure am. Go ahead. Right, right now, count to five and then go ahead and start. Okay. Good evening, everyone. This is Tim Turnham. I'm the Executive Director of the Melanoma Research Foundation, and I'm very pleased that you've chosen to join us for what I think is an extremely significant webinar, The Changing Landscape of Melanoma Therapy with New Drug Approvals. And I'm thrilled that we are presenting this um, in partnership with the Melanoma National Foundation. And actually, they've invited us to join them on a... The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So I'm very pleased that we're able to do this uh, webinar with the Melanoma International Foundation. Um, I'm Turnham from the Melanoma Research Foundation. And we, uh, both of our organizations are committed to uh, reaching out to patients and helping patients and making advances in the melanoma world. And we're very pleased to see the changes that are happening in the landscape for melanoma therapy. And, and I think you'll uh, be pleased to hear some of the ways that, that melanoma treatment and, and, uh, and uh, the options for patients are changing this evening. We're, we're um, extremely fortunate to be joined by Dr. Tony Rivas, uh, who is an outstanding clinician and just a wonderful human being. Um, I, I've known Dr. Rivas for a while now through his work on, uh, in melanoma and uh, some things that he's done with the Melanoma Research Foundation. Uh, we have been funding uh, research for a number of years, and we're very careful about what research we fund. Our grants are highly competitive, and I'm pleased to say that uh, Dr. Rebus is one of the recipients of our grants this year, one of only two who received our highest level of grant award uh, this year, and we'll be funding it for the next couple of years. So I think it speaks well to the caliber of work that he does. Dr. Rebus is a medical doctor who studied at the University of Barcelona in Spain. Uh, did a doctoral dissertation on interleukin-2, and has studied extensively at some of the finest programs in uh, the country and even around the world. Um, Dr. Rivas is originally from Spain and is a huge lover of espresso. Um, so I guess having said all of that, you'll get to hear uh, what a wonderful speaker he is and, and the information that he has. And Dr. Rivas, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you for this uh, very nice and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, opening of, of this, of this uh, webinar. And I want to first thank uh, uh, Catherine Pulley uh, from the Melanoma International Foundation and a new team from the Melanoma Research Foundation for putting this together. And um, it's what I'm going to be talking about is the exciting time that we are in, uh, in advances of treatments uh, for melanoma a disease that until recently there was little uh, uh, treatment options, but that in, uh, let's see if I find a way to advance the slide. Um, the, uh, can, can you advance, can someone advance the slide? Okay, here we go. But now with the new developments that are mainly taking uh, knowledge from the laboratory into the clinic, are reverting into patient benefit. And we're still not there to be able to control this disease in a significant way in the majority of patients, but we are making a lot of progress in a short period of time, suggesting to us that if we continue on this path, we're going to really make a difference in this disease. And I'm going to focus uh, all of my talk on metastatic melanoma, uh, which is uh, uh, when melanoma has gone beyond where it started, it usually starts in the skin, and then it can travel through lymph, lymphatic vessels, or through the uh, or through the blood, um, to other sites of the, uh, of the body, and that's where it would be a stage four or metastatic melanoma. And there, at, at, at that stage, surgery is no longer a viable option for the great majority of cases, although it can be for some. Radiation therapy, it's a suboptimal option because it's a spot treatment as opposed to covering the whole body. It has no ability to do that. Uh, chemotherapy had traditionally, uh, with whatever we had uh, tried, very low response rates. In the majority of cases, was around 1 in 10 patients had, some, uh, had a response. And then a variety of immune-stimulating approaches, uh, mostly older versions of cytokines and vaccines, 
had anecdotal benefit, but not a reproducible benefit. But there are, there's two areas that have made a lot of advances in this past three or four years and uh, are now reverting into having new FDA approved uh, drugs either recently approved or that are going to be approved within the next several months or where this are going to be approved. And those are from this, the two areas of research that are depicted in this slide. One of them is immunotherapy or trying to harness the ability of the immune system to attack the tumor. And he is depicted on, on the left-hand side by having the thymus, that's where the immune system is trained, and then going uh, uh, from training the immune system, going into uh, into the, uh, um, and can we go back one slide, please? Uh, going uh, going to the rest of the body. And the other area of, of advances is uh, the targeted therapy or understanding what is driving the growth of the cancer and can we block it specifically with a spe uh, with a, uh, uh, with drugs so we'll go to the next slide please so I first uh, focus on immunotherapy and then we'll focus on targeted therapy there are two approaches that are being developed right now independently but it's uh, it's obvious to all of us, and I'm sure it will be by the end of the uh, of this uh, of this webinar that uh, uh, there's possibilities of combining them. So we've known for many years, for probably 20 or 30 years, that occasionally patients with metastatic melanoma do well, and whenever they did well, was because something happened uh, that we couldn't understand that led to that tumor responding to the attack of the own body, and we always assume that's the immune system. Well, now we're starting to understand how to do this reproducibly and how is the immune system regulated to attack the cancer. So the idea is we want to harness the immune system to focus on the cancer, when usually the immune system is not focusing on the cancer, it's focusing on protecting us from viruses or, or bacteria that come from the outside but can we retrain the immune system or can we modulate it in some way that attacks the cancer? Well, now this is a standard of care in melanoma because we have two uh, uh, approvals in the adjuvant setting, the older approval being high dose interferon and the new, the newly approved uh, uh, agent which is pegylated interferon, so it's a variation of interferon that stays in the body for a longer time, so hopefully taking away some of the toxicities of high dose interferon, and that was uh, uh, approved by the FDA, uh, I think, last, uh, last month. And then two immunotherapy agents in metastatic melanoma, uh, high dose interleukin-2, which is a very toxic uh, approach of, of uh, stimulating the immune system that was approved uh, as, uh, over 10 years ago, and ipilimumab, which has the commercial name of Yervoid, that was approved just uh, one month ago. And we'll go to the next slide, please. So uh, can we go back? It, if there's a way I can, I can control it, it would be much better, let's see. No, it, it doesn't seem to be working for me. So can, can we just go one? So here we have in the center a melanoma cell uh, the, in brown and then we have an immune system cell or lymphocyte that has a specific receptor that recognizes a specific protein on the surface of the melanoma and whenever it recognizes that it, uh, it has the ability to kill it if this lymphocyte or immune system cell has been activated the right way and the ways to activate it can we uh, are either cytokines that are in, like interleukin-2 or interferon that we talked about, but newer forms of these of cytokines, interleukin-15 or interleukin-21, two agents that are also in clinical development for melanoma, or with vaccines. And there's been several generations of vaccines, either peptides, dendritic cells, or a tumor uh, or tumor vaccines. But those these ways of stimulating the immune system have low immunological potency or low ability to stimulate a large army of uh, uh, killer lymphocytes for melanoma, mostly because they are, it, uh, we're not addressing how the immune system is regulated by itself. And it can be regulated by positive receptors or negative receptors. 
the positive receptors would be CD40, CD137, or OX40. And uh, there's antibodies depicted in green in this slide that can activate those receptors around clinical development for melanoma. And then there's breaks to the immune system. The one that we know the best is called CTLA-4, but there's another one called PD-1. And there's antibodies that have been developed that block these negative regulators or breaks for the immune system. All of these approaches, having the uh, uh, the the final result of a stimulating the immune system to attack the cancer. And uh, uh, the CD4 blocking antibody is uh, the one that's, uh, that's approved is Yervoy or Ipilimumab. There's another way to do this, which is here in the approaches on the top, we're trying to stimulate the immune system in the patient's body. But that immune system can be manipulated in a different way by taking out immune system cells and giving them back to patients. And that's the approaches of the TIL therapy or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or uh, cloning TIL lymphocytes for peripheral blood, from peripheral blood or creating a large army of these lymphocytes by genetically engineering them and giving them receptors to become a melanoma specific uh, killer cells. So the, where we have the the, the more patients treated and, uh, and more experiences with uh, the immune stimulating cytokines like interleukin-2. And uh, here we depict um, a graph of patients' outcome uh, of patients that were treated probably around 15 to 20 years ago with, uh, with a, a high-dose interleukin-2. And uh, this graph is a little bit misleading, and, and I have to recognize this from the start. Uh, it's a graph that depicts 43 patients out of 270 treated. And it, uh, the, the 43 patients are the 43 patients that had a response out of 207, so that's a response of less than 20%. But if you can see this, uh, these graphs that uh, say, uh, say the percentage of patients with continued response, there's on top of a, gra a graph that where the great majority of patients continue on response. There's very few patients there, but it tells us something important which is once somebody has a response to high dose interleukin-2, even though it's low frequency of response, it's very important for that patient because it goes from having a deadly disease to, in the majority of cases, having a long-term sur long survival uh, despite having metastatic melanoma. The more modern way to do this is with ipilimumab or Yervoy. And here, th the graph is different. It includes the over 650 patients that were on this study, not only the ones that had the response, but all of them. And it compares a control arm, that's the, the survival curve on the bottom, and then two arms that had ipilimumab. And you can see that the patients who were on the ipilimumab uh, groups did better than the, the, other, the other patients. But still, the benefit continues to be a small percentage of patients. And the really meaningful benefit is these patients that are at the end of the curve that continue for a long period of time. Here we see up to 50, uh, 50 months, so uh, 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 several uh, over four years of being alive and well despite having a, a metastatic melanoma. So the main point about these uh, slides is that the biggest impact of immunotherapy approaches, either high dose interleukin-2 or ipilimumab or Yervoy, is on the patients that, are, that have a response and continue with a response for a long period of time beyond what it would be expected uh, for other patients with this disease. So um, we've been talking about Yervoy or ipilimumab, and here's a depiction of, uh, that I, take from, uh, I took from Jed Wolchok that uh, helps a lot in explaining what does CTL4 blocking antibody or ipilimumab uh, uh, do. And to s stimulate an immune response, we need to have a very specific interaction between an antigen on the tumor cell and a T cell receptor or the receptor of the immune system cells that recognize that antigen. And that's a very, very fine recognition system where if you change just one little bit of a protein, one amino acid, it will not work any, anymore. So that would be like having a key to your car. And if you go to your car, you can turn on the engine of your car. But if you take the same key of your car and go to your friend's car and try to turn on the engine, it will not work. So that's how 
of how, how that's the finest specificity of these lymphocytes. They're very specific for certain antigens in tumors. Um, once you turn on the, ga the uh, 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 turn on the engine of your car to get the car moving, you want to step on the gas, and that's what is uh, provided by the costumatory molecules that are the required second a signal that these lymphocytes need to get to be able uh, to to be licensed to kill melanoma cells. But as you have a car that's turned on and you're stepping on the gas, one of the first next things you want to do is step on the brake so this car doesn't go out of control. Well, that's what uh, that the brake is the CTLA-4, and your boy or ipilimumab is a blocker of the brake. So the end result is now you have a car without a brake. Well, that is great if this car goes and attacks melanoma. It's not that good if this car goes and attack uh, uh, car goes and attacks normal tissues, and it does do in some in, in some cases. And we'll talk about this when we summarize the results of ipilimumab. So here are my facts about ipilimumab and trying to distill a large body of data into something that is just four bullet points. The first one is there's no question it works. There have been two randomized clinical trials with different schedules of ipilimumab, different combinations, that those two randomized trials show uh, uh, an improvement in overall survival compared to the control arms. So it's better to be on ipilimumab than to be in a control arm, either with a vaccine or with, DT or with DTIC. So the FDA recognized that and gave ipilimumab with the commercial name of Yerboi a very broad label uh, uh, for the treatment of patients with metastatic melanoma. But as I showed you in those graphs, the major benefit is evident in a small uh, percent of patients. In my assessment, 10, 15 percent, you could say maybe 20 percent of the patients, but it's still a minority of patients. But the most important thing is the ones that I think have the major benefit, or looking at the data, I, I would assume that have the major benefit, are patients who then go on to have normal lives. And I'm following a patient who participated in the first in human phase one trial of ipilimumab, which was done 10 years ago. And the patient continues to be alive and well and melanoma free. Uh, when she started, she had softball size metastatic melanomas in the, in the lung. So it, it can happen. It's low frequency, but once it happens, it's really important uh, uh, to not miss it. Um, it's hard to assess responses to ipilimumab, and it takes some period of time where we don't know what's happening. Uh, the first several months, uh, uh, even the patients who go on to respond, it's hard to see that they are responding. Sometimes a new lesion may appear. Sometimes a lesion may look bigger than when it started, which makes it very hard to this make strong decisions about continuing on ipilimumab or switching to something else if we think it's not working. But the, my take-home message is that we have to give ipilimumab and all immune stimulants that work in this, in this way a fair chance to declare if they're working or not uh, before calling it a day. And the last bullet point is that there's significant inflammatory and immune toxicities in around one-fifth of the patients. That means that four-fifths of the patients have no side effects, but the one-fifth that have them, it's because the immune system attack no, normal organs whenever we release this uh, this CTLA-4 uh, break with ipilimumab. And that can put some patients into uh, serious problems, most frequently from colitis or uh, bad diarrhea that's induced by the immune system attacking uh, the colon with occasional toxic deaths with, uh, with these agents. So that's something that needs to be considered when discussing this uh, new treatment with, uh, with patients. But what the, is the, pos uh, the, the positive outcome of this, of this uh, form of treatment is this uh, series of patients that uh, a journalist from Forbes chronicled in a, in a series of articles that he called miracle survivors. And here's actually two of my patients on, uh, on the top left, uh, um, um, 
uh, high school uh, a teacher from UCLA and on the bottom uh, right a physician from New Zealand, both of whom came some years ago to re, uh, with metas, a bad method in the study of melanomas. They received the CD4 blocking antibody. And th at that time, we were using a different CD4 blocking antibody called tremolimumab from a different company, but the results were more or less the same. And these patients go on to have these durable responses uh, that are lasting years with, uh, without any other evidence of melanoma. The key thing about this is then to understand how are these responses being mediated, and then can we take that information and try to go over this limit that yeah, uh, CDL4 blocking antibodies have uh, when they're used by themselves or when they're combined with a with a peptide vaccine or DTA uh, or the DSCS was tested with a, with the airboy. So in the left hand side we have a patient who in 2005 had metastatic melanoma, some lesions that we could see, and two months later, after receiving a CDR4 blocking antibody, those lesions were disappearing, so we, we saw a series of these patients, we took a series of biopsies, and what we could see in these cases was that those tumors that were full of melanoma now were replaced by immune system cells, and that's what the picture on the right uh, is depicting, which is a um, microscope image of a tumor that's regressing, and we're staining in brown for immune killer cells called CD8 positive T cells or cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and leaving in blue the melanoma cells. And you can see that there's very few blue cells that are surrounded by all of these brown dots. Those brown dots are the immune system attacking the melanoma, what we were trying to achieve with these CDR4 blocking antibodies. But as, as we discussed, this happens in a, min, a minority of cases. So can we try to bypass all of the limitations of turning on the immune system with vaccines, with interleukin-2, with interferon, or with ipilimumab or CDR4 blocking antibodies, and create the effectors of this uh, of this anti-tumor activity, which are these uh, these uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes or CD8 positive lymphocytes, and that would be the concept of adoptive cell transfer. Can we create outside the body the large army of lymphocytes that would then go into a, into infiltrate the tumors, and we would have an image like this one where the tumor is now replaced by immune system cells. So. We can do that because we know now exactly what these lymphocytes are recognizing in melanoma. So these lymphocytes, which are white blood cells, have a receptor called the T cell receptor that has two chains, the alpha and the beta chain, and that receptor recognizes an antigen or a piece of a melanoma protein that's presented on the surface of melanoma. So it allows this lymphocyte to recognize what's happening inside this melanoma and very specifically attack melanomas that have one specific receptor, uh, one specific uh, antigen on their surface. So if we know which are the lymphocytes that attack, that can recognize and attack melanoma, then those lymphocytes can be expanded ex people. And that can be done by taking a tumor lesion and growing the lymphocytes from the tumor because uh, they made it into the tumor because they have the right receptors. That's uh, the TIL therapy or the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. We can take uh, lymphocytes from the blood and then look for the few lymphocytes that are melanoma specific and expand them ex vivo and then those can be given back to patients uh, to uh, lead to a, a treatment for melanoma. We can take the receptors from a patient that had a good outcome by attacking melanoma, and then put them into a gene transfer vector and infect lymphocytes from patients that have no ability to attack melanoma for whatever reason, their immune system doesn't develop melanoma killer cells, but now we can give them the receptor that allows those lymphocytes or killer cells to recognize melanoma, and those can be infused back into patients, and that's what's called the T cell receptor or TCR redirected lymphocytes. And the last way that, can this, uh, the, that this can be done is by not only putting the natural 
T cell receptor, but putting an antibody on the surface of lymphocytes that allowed them to recognize a surface protein in melanoma, and that's what's called chimeric antigen receptor or CAR redirected lymphocytes. So these are three means of generating outside of the body a large army of melanoma killer cells and reinfusing them back into patients. And the, uh, the largest uh, experience uh, for these forms of therapy is at the surgery branch uh, in the National Cancer Institute, uh, led by Steve Rosenberg, uh, who has been doing these kind of uh, 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 approaches for many years. And with some uh, bias for uh, the patients that make it to the, to the National Cancer Institute, uh, and taking into account that not all patients can have this kind of therapy, maybe because they don't have lymphocytes in their tumors or because their lymphocytes don't grow well or for several other reasons. But the patients who go on to these uh, therapies, there is a, a reproducible high response rate, which tells us that if somebody creates an army of lymphocytes against melanoma, and those are reinfused into patients with all of the conditions optimized, uh, that can lead to responses. And uh, at several sites outside of the NIH, at MD Anderson, at, uh, uh, in Seattle at the Fred, uh, Fred Church, uh Cancer Center, and at UCLA, we have established similar pro uh, programs, and we're seeing the same kind of results, where there's large armies of highly activated melanoma killer cells can be generated and infused back into patients and, and, and uh, have uh, derived benefits for those patients. So what should we expect on uh, melanoma immunotherapy uh, for the next several months and years? Well, I think we'll, uh, we'll probably in the next several years we'll see results of uh, two studies that are ongoing of using ipilimumab to prevent melanoma relapse in patients who have a stage 3 melanoma that have a high risk of a melanoma coming back. There's new generations of antibodies, and we could talk more extensively about anti-PD-1. It's a, a, an immune-modulating antibody similar to ipilimumab that also takes out a break for the immune system. There's new ways to turn on the immune system, either by new cytokines, like interleukin-21, so we're getting into the 20s of uh, uh, cytokines or interleukins that have been tested. Uh, the one that's approved is interleukin-2, but here we have 21 being developed. And then a vaccine approach that's called on Oncovax, which is a virus that can replicate in tumors and then should stimulate an immune response that's being tested in a, in a large randomized trial. But also we'll see that these uh, adoptive cell transfer therapies that are personalized cell therapies for patients that are now being done in very few uh, places with their reproducible anti-tumor activity and the increased knowledge on how to generate these kind of therapies, I'm pretty sure that that will be um, uh, treatments that will be more broadly applicable to patients with metastatic melanoma. And the final bullet point is uh, about combinations of ipilimumab with other melanoma therapies, uh, in particular targeted therapies, uh, that uh, we're going to go into now. So we've talked on the first part of, the, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this seminar about the new developments on, on immunotherapy for melanoma, and now we'll go on to talk about the new developments on targeted therapies for melanoma. And again, uh, as I said at the beginning of this, uh, 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 of this talk, is that both of these areas of significant advance for the treatment of patients with metastatic melanoma has been by, by applying information that we gathered from preclinical studies and in the laboratory and applied into patients. And one of the nice examples of this is by an, understanding what are the genes that are telling melanoma cells to grow and how those genes are different in, this, in, the, in different flavors of melanoma, which also led us to recognize that those are important and should be turned off in some way. So here we have a slide where we depict the most, on the top, the most common type of melanoma, which is the melanoma rising in the skin 
of non-chronic sun damage areas, mostly in the trunk or, or, in, on, or, in, the, uh, or in the arms and legs, of patients who are, uh, uh, um, who are younger uh, in age and where the majority have mutually exclusive or uh, 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 mutual exclusive would mean that one or the other, but not both of them. Mute, so they have mutual exclusive uh, mutations in two genes, BRAF or NRAS, but there's nearly no mutations on another gene called CKIT, as opposed to tumors that arise in, uh, uh, in uh, more advanced populations that have chronic sun damaged skin and appear in the, uh, in the face or in the, or, or in the under in the dorsal part of the uh, of the hands, so places where we have the most skin, uh, uh, the most sun uh, sun exposure, and there the makeup of these tumors is dramatically different. They have a lot less frequency of BRAF or MRAS mutations, and continue to have low frequency of CKID mutation, and that's as opposed to the melanomas that appear in surfaces that are not sun exposed, either mucosal melanomas that can be in the nose, in the in the mouth, or or in the gut or melanomas that appear in the non-sun exposed uh, uh, parts of the hands and the feet and the palms and the soles, where the frequency of genes uh, that are present in the, in the first type of melanoma, the BRAF and the NRAS, is very low, but then we start having increased frequency of mutations in CKIT. And all of this is in comparison to melanomas from the eye, which have different mutations called GNAQ and GNA11, but they do not have BRAF, NRAS, or CKID mutations. So all of these mutual exclusive mutations are all important. They are, it's biology telling us that there's something here that's not random, that it happens because these cells depend on these mutations. So I'm going to focus most of the, uh, the rest of the targeted therapy uh, part of this talk on BRAF. Why? Because it's the most common one, and two, because it, uh, there's a successful drug development uh, by targeting BRAF. So the best way to explain these funny name mutations is that they are what nature has developed to bring signals from the outside of the cell to the nucleus of the cell and allow to tell the cell you should be growing or not growing. And that's important because whenever we uh, uh, were, uh, uh, we develop from a, fe as a, uh, from a fetus to an adult body, we have to have signals that tell our cells to be dividing so we get our adult size. And then when we're in our adult size, then we have to have signals that tell that this should not be going on anymore, that we don't need our nose and our ears to be growing anymore. They are, are achieve the size that a human should, should have. So then this process should be turned off. But cancer, and in particular melanoma, has find, found a way to trick nature and then mutate or change one part of the protein, in this case I'm depicting BRAF. So then the cell is now told all the time to be continuously growing and proliferating to make baby cells. And that's what the cancer does. It just continuously makes cells and cells and cells and doesn't stop, even though it makes no sense that it should be doing that. Well, this is like a switch that should be on or off, and now it's stuck on the on position. So that's what BRAF does. It turns on a switch, and this cell is turned on all the time. So any of you would be, tell me, well, why don't you turn the switch off? And that's what this new generation of drugs can do. PLX4032, which is, uh, also has a series of other names, RG7204, and now it's also called Vemurafenib, and probably in the next several months we'll have a, uh, a commercial name. Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to confuse you, but it's, it's just several age, uh, the same agent has been given several names depending on who's developing it. And then there's another one that uh, we usually know by, as the GSK BRAF inhibitor or GSK8436, uh, which is working at the same level as the, as the Plexicon or the Roche BRAF inhibitor. So what would happen when you block BRAF? Well, then you're blocking 
the gene that's telling the cell to grow, and then the cell goes into uh, uh, stops growing just because we're blocking all of these. So we can see this clearly that it actually happens the way it was planned. So on the left-hand side, we have this linear pathway, the PRAF, that signals to something called MEC, ERK, and then controls the cell cycle. And we have different readouts for this pathway. And here we have biopsies of actually one of our patients uh, who had a biopsy at baseline. And you can see on top that there's all this brown staining. That means that ERK, which is downstream of PRAF, is, is turned on. All of the brown staining tells us that this is a melanoma cell that's being told to be growing all the time through a, a downstream of PRAF uh, through ERK. And then it controls something, a, a protein that controls cell cycle, and it's telling the cell to be on cycle all the time. And then there's another marker called KI67 that tells us which cells are dividing. So you can see that a significant number of cells in this biopsy were dividing. Well, just uh, after 15 days of taking PLX4032, we would assume that all of these should be turned off if the drug is really doing what it's supposed to be doing. And actually, it did it uh, better than we would, uh, we would ever think that any drug could do it. You can see the night and day difference between the brown stain on the left-hand side column and the blue stain or non-brown stain on the right-hand side. And there's some that you say, oh, this is still brown. Well, this is a non-melanoma cell. This is a blood vessel. So this drug is intelligent enough to turn off ERK, or the effector of PRAP, in the melanoma cells and not in the normal cells. And that leads to these cells that were dividing to stop dividing, because we see a lot less brown dots here and here. Well, this is not only something that's important uh, to be seen in the biopsies. It's telling us that the drug was designed one way, and it's actually working that way on patients. But then the more important thing is, does that lead to patient benefit? And here we can see PET scans from four of the sites uh, where patients were treated in the phase one trial. And we can see a PET scan before and a PET scan on day 15, so just 15 days later from these four patients. We can, we can just focus on the ones that have the most staining at baseline. So PET scans, the, the brain always uh, scores positive because the brain takes up the, the, uh, the PET probe that's called FTG. And then the blood that collects the radioactivity. And sometimes we can see the heart that uh, has the radioactivity while the PET tracer goes through the heart if it's done early. But all of this is melanoma in the liver. You can see within 15 days, you can barely see anything like that. You can see this other very uh, dramatic example of a patient with a whole bunch of bone metastases that 15 days later, you have to be very careful and not calling this a normal PET scan. So telling us that within a very short period of time, this drug was able to turn off the signaling uh, from BRAF, and that led to changes in uh, that can be detected by PET scan, but not only by PET scan by uh, measuring the size of the tumors and adding them all up, we can see that the great majority of patients that were treated in this phase one trial that we, uh, that we published last year were deriving benefit from this treatment. And this is a, a trial that was uh, headed by Keith Flaherty, who was at that time at uh, Penn and now is at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, in Boston and the Massachusetts General Hospital. But it was a, a study that was done at uh, different sites, uh, 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 at Vanderbilt, um, MD Anderson, UCLA, uh, Peter Mack in Australia, and uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And what we saw reproducibly at all of the sites is that the great majority of patients responded. So here in this plot, each column is one patient. You can see that there's only two patients where the columns go upwards. That means that the tumor didn't respond and grew while on therapy. While all of the other ones, the columns go downward, meaning that there was decrease in size of the tumors. So we measured those tumors. We added all of the sizes, and we saw what's the difference at baseline or afterwards. This is what is called a waterfall plot, because responses go down. 
Well, this is the first time ever I had seen a waterfall plot presented in a study of melanoma. But this is not just one study. This is reproducible. When we did a larger study that was uh, presented by uh, Jeff Sossman at the meeting in Australia, and we'll update these results at the, uh, at the, mini, at the large oncology meeting that will, uh, will happen in, in less than a month in, in, uh, in Chicago. Well, you can see that there's a lot more column, uh, a lot more columns here, and all of these are individual patients, 132 of them, and you can see that overall it looks similar, where the great majority of patients have significant tumor shrinkage, and a minority of, the, uh, of patients do not derive benefit from these. So I was telling you that this is what's called the waterfall plot, and that nobody dared to show a waterfall plot in melanoma until we got these results, because uh, until recently, a waterfall plot in melanoma would be what I would call a geyser plot, where we have a whole bunch of patients not responding, and an occasional patient, usually around 10% of the patients, responding to a variety of things that we have tried. But now that we have these BRAF inhibitors, whenever we treat patients who have that mutation, it doesn't work in patients who don't have BRAF inhibitors. Then we have a true waterfall plot where we have a whole bunch of patients responding and very few patients having the geyser or non-responding. Once there's a change in the field like this one, the lay press starts being interested. And you cannot uh, get more lay press than the National Enquirer. And actually, the National Enquirer was the first one to report on PLX4032 in this article that you could read uh, while you're, you're waiting to pay in your grocery store. Uh, you could read about PLX4032 in data that Paul Chapman had presented uh, with these, uh, from these early studies. Well, the National Enquirer uh, was working on this, but also the New York Times, a much more serious lay press uh, uh, journal, was working on this. And uh, it's an inside joke for academic centers that we always are worried about being scooped on our data. Well, uh, the National Enquirer scooped the New York Times. And here you can see Keith Flaherty at the front page of the New York Times in, in a series of articles uh, um, uh, written by Amy Harmon. Uh, 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 chronicling some of the patients being treated in, in these early studies, ending with an article that was quite troublesome, which is actually an article from two patients treated at UCLA by my colleague uh, Bartosz Chimelowski, uh, who first treated one patient who had BRAF mutant metastatic melanoma and started that patient on PLX4032. And unfortunately, around two months later, his cousin, uh, develop also a BRAF mutant metastatic melanoma. But his cousin came to UCLA at the time when we only had one study uh, with PLX4032, which was the phase three study where half of the patients uh, were randomized or uh, by a, 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 a turn of a coin would be allocated to either have a, a control treatment, which in that case was a chemotherapy drug, or receive PLX4032. And it wasn't difficult to predict the results of these two uh, cousins, which one, the cousin that didn't get the PLX4032 had progression of disease because the responses to the chemotherapy is very low and, and died shortly after, while the patient who was on the, on, on, on the experimental drug derived, uh, 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 had a benefit by having a response, and uh, actually he it lasted for quite a bit of time. So that led to many people start questioning the ethics of such a, a study and questioning, uh, should we be developing drugs uh, through doing these randomized studies? And uh, one of the biggest sounding boards is the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the, the most, uh, uh, um, the, high, the highest ranked uh, uh, medicine journal. And there's been two articles there talking about these two patients and talking about these clinical trials with BRAF inhibitors and melanoma, one of them saying that maybe it's not right to be, uh, to be uh, uh, randomizing patients to a control arm that has little activity reproducibly when we have an experimental arm that has very high activity. And the other one uh, saying that maybe this drug should have been approved from the phase one study, from the early data that I showed you before, and not have to do more patients because it's just such a change in the field. 
well, now I've told you the good things about this drug, but it also has uh, uh, has a, a dark side. Uh, one of the, it, it's the toxicities, and uh, the one that worries the most is that this drug that turns off melanoma can induce other other cancers. And until now, we've only seen cancers in the skin called squamous cell carcinomas of keratoconduma type, uh, which are easily uh, uh, dealt by doing uh, by doing surgery, but there is a potential that this could happen with uh, squamous cell carcinomas at other sites in the lung or in the bladder. Something that we have not seen, but there is a potential that that could happen. There's also skin toxicities and photosensitivity. Many of the patients who take these drugs cannot be exposed to minutes of sunlight and also joint pains in some patients that can be debilitating and uh, may lead to adjusting the doses. But the biggest problem is that despite these traumatic responses that we're seeing, the melanoma in the majority of cases is finding a way to grow back, and that's what's called acquired resistance. And this is depicted in this uh, bar graph where each row is a patient, and it starts from uh, a whenever the patients start on treatment, and it, there's a diamond whenever the patients qualify as having a response, and then following up until the end of, the, of this row where we have uh, either progressive disease, that's the red dots, or patients who continue on response. So the good news is that there's now patients that are ongoing for over two years with continued response to PLX4032. But you can see that then there's patients like this one where the response only lasted for two weeks, so barely qualifying for any meaningful benefit for this patient. But the key of all of this is that something happened here. The tumor responded at some point and then started regrowing. And it's because we blocked what was driving the tumor to grow, and now it has something else that allows the tumor to grow. So it's something they should be able to uh, to understand. But I'm depicting this problem with this uh, patient of ours, uh, Lee Reyes, who is a, a young patient from uh, from Fresno who came to UCLA to, uh, to receive this treatment, had a very nice response, and then progressed. So I, want, uh, I don't want to mislead anyone. This very nice waterfall plot in the majority of cases turns back into a geyser plot where whenever the tumor comes back. But it also gives us an opportunity. So here we have CAT scans so from one, uh, another one of our patients. Here we have uh, a cut uh, around the blood vessels of the heart where there's melanoma masses uh, by the heart vessels or a melanoma mass in the lung or a melanoma mass in a, in a, in a rib. And you can see that two months later, you can barely see any of these masses. The lung mass, it's nearly gone, and the, the rib has uh, uh, has uh, uh, is now looking back to normal. It doesn't have all of this area that's occupied by melanoma. But two months later, this tumor regrow here and this tumor regrow here, but not the other tumors. The lung tumor didn't regrow and this one didn't regrow. So something changed in this tumor and this tumor compared to baseline because now it's regrowing despite continuing on treatment. So with uh, Roger Lowe, who was a uh, 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 acknowledged by the Melanoma International Foundation uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago for his, wor uh, his work on studying tumors that we collected on patients that, were, that uh, were having resistance to melanoma compared to tumors that we had collected at baseline. And both uh, between his lab and my lab, we generated a whole bunch of these paired samples, and we also made cell lines from these tumors so we could uh, uh, study them better. He reported this first data on how these tumors are changing and what are the molecular mechanisms. And the importance of this is that can lead to treatments for other patients. But that was also chronicled in, uh, by the New York Times, and here we have Roger Lowe in the front page uh, doing a biopsy of a patient, and we are in debt to our patients that have been very proactive in wanting to have their tumors biopsied at the base, at the beginning and afterwards because the knowledge that we're generating in the majority of cases is helping other patients, but in some cases is starting to allow us to define what is the treatment for these resistance mechanisms and can we, can we uh, 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 
uh, can we put can we suggest patients to have uh, uh, a treatment uh, a treatment afterwards that can put melanoma under control another time so I'm reaching the end of uh, 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 of the talk which is I'm um, trying to summarize by looking at the benefits of these two different types of treatments that are reverting into benefits for patients with metastatic melanoma. And here's what we call a Kaplan-Meier plot, and in red would be the control arm, what we would, be, would expect with uh, uh, treatments uh, that were available two or three years ago, and what we can achieve with treatments that are leading to some responses in a low percentage of patients, but those are durable. So these patients should be down here, but now they are up here. So that means that they are alive when they weren't supposed to be alive, and they are alive years later. And that's what uh, what ipilimumab or uh, or high dose interleukin two can achieve. And that's different from the other type of treatment that I that I, that I talked to you about: these targeted therapies with BRAF inhibitors that uh, derive nearly immediate benefit in the majority of patients, but with time, that benefit. It stops. Uh, 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 it stops because the tumor finds bypassing uh, uh, mechanisms. We don't have the end of this curve because we still don't know where the end of this curve, and also because we're developing new treatments, and maybe we'll have new bombs here, and we'll be making uh, 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 some progress in the treatment of this disease uh, in a significant number of patients. So the concluding slides is that uh for blocking antibodies uh, I, uh, with uh, ipilimumab or Yerboi being the one uh, clinically approved uh, provide low frequency but extremely durable responses in some patients with melanoma that we can get higher response rates by doing adoptive cell transfer approaches with different approaches with the uh, TILs or T cell receptor transgenic cells that BRAF inhibitors are a new addition to the potential treatments for melanoma, and in patients who have this mutation called BRAF P600T, they have very high initial response rate, but, uh, but, uh, but in the majority of cases, the, tu the tumor will find a way to regrow, and now we're understanding how it's doing that, and it's leading, uh, leading to the fine clinical trials that address the escape mechanisms, in particular adding MEK inhibitors or PIT or AKT inhibitors. So with this, I'll be happy to take uh, to take questions and turn it back to to Catherine and Lisa and team. Thank you, Tony. Um, this is Catherine Poole, president and founder of the Melanoma International Foundation, and we truly appreciate this wonderful webinar uh, with Tony. I have to tell you, Tony, that. Um, one of the patients that asked a few of these questions said to us that her doctor thought she was really brilliant from listening to our last webinar because she came in just armed with information. And that's what these webinars really do. They educate our patients, and that makes them empowered to, to deal with everything. So thank you so much. Um, I wanted to start with some questions about anti-PD-1. We actually have a couple. Um, the first is uh, the person wanted to know about the status of anti-PD-1. We really haven't heard much on the trials. Um, and will they include IPI or um, your VOI users in the, in the near future? So. Um Unfortunately, we haven't worked much with anti-PD-1, so I, I can answer what's, uh, what is the general information I have from other sites. So the excitement with PD-1, uh, anti-PD-1, is that the early data that was presented last year by Mario Snow on uh, uh, presenting data for uh, several groups in the US was that the response rates to this immune modeling antibody that works similar, similarly to ipilimumab or Yervoi were a little bit higher than with ipilimumab, um, but uh, and, and, and the toxicities were a little bit lower. So obviously that's exciting. Uh, if we get a better agent uh, that can also lead to these long-term survivors that are achieved with ipilimumab, then we would have a better agent taken into the clinic. Um, that was. Uh, 
when, he, uh, when uh, under PD-1 was used alone, and uh, there were plans to continue developing uh, this antibody, but it seems that the antibody is going slower than it would be desirable on its clinical testing because there's a practical uh, issue about how is an antibody that's similar to ipilimumab being developed uh, by the same company that has ipilimumab and in a field where ipilimumab has already shown an impact in survival. Uh, there, is, there, there are studies, there's at least one study that it's combining both of the agents and we're eagerly awaiting for results of, uh, from that study, but I haven't seen anything reported yet. Yes, I mean, I, I would think it would be beneficial for you know, the company to have two highly successful drugs as well. So we're, we have a, a few patients on our forum who, who have been on the anti-PD-1 and um, our NED uh, have no evidence of disease now and doing very well. So we're all excited yes. about this, the possibility. Um, are there any promising new targeted therapies uh, for BRAF and CKIT negative people? So yeah, that's that's a great point because uh, all of this uh, story with uh, with BRAF and uh, a similar story with uh, CKIT mutant melanoma that can be treated by uh, drugs like Gwivec or nilotinib or desatinib, which are specific inhibitors of CKIT, uh, that are leading these high res uh, responses, leaves out around 50% of the patients that do not have either one of these mutations. There's been 20, 30 years now of research trying to develop inhibitors to NRAS, which is the next most common mutation in melanoma. But for reasons that escape me a little bit, it has not been feasible to develop an inhibitor to NRAS. Uh, it's because it's a different type of protein that nobody has found a way to develop a small molecule that can circulate through the body and block uh, uh, this NRAS. There's also interest in blocking uh, GNAQ and GNA11, which are the two dominant mutations in eye melanomas. And again, those are kind of proteins that nobody has been able to develop an inhibitor for. Uh, there is some data that you could, that, that, that MEK inhibitors could work in some of these cases, but it, uh, the, most of the data is less solid, uh, a lot less solid than blocking the oncogene, the BRAF, uh, uh, the, the way, uh, with the data that we've seen. So I think we have a big unmet medical need for patients who are BRAF and seeking negative, at least for, uh, in terms of the targeted therapies. Um, there's no evidence that BRAF, NRAS, or CKIT has anything to do with responses to ipilimumab or any other immune stimulant or PD-1. Uh, because responses have been seen in patients with or without those mutations. So mm -hmm. those would be available for all of the patients. And what about the MEC? Is, aren't more people that are um, BRAF negative possibly going to respond to that? So we, if we believe cell line data, and we have to believe cell line data because all of this has first been tested in cell lines, we know that BRAF mutant melanoma responds to MEC a lot better than BRAF wild-type melanoma, including NRAS mutants, CKID mutants, or GNQ mutants. So if in cell lines, yeah, MEK works less frequently in BRAF negative melanoma, we would assume that in the clinic, it would happen the same. My read of MEK inhibitors is that by themselves, they they'll have a lot of difficulty competing with BRAF inhibitors because their response rate in BRAF mutant melanoma, which is their best, uh, 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 their best uh, area to be developed, uh, is, uh, is lower than the BRAF inhibitors and their toxicity is higher. And in patients who do not have BRAF mutant melanoma, then we would expect much lower response rates. So there it leaves us that it's probably not, it's something that can be tried, but it's something that doesn't have the expectation of benefit that BRAF uh, inhibitors have in BRAF mutant melanoma. But there's one important thing about MEK inhibitors, which is they can be given with BRAF inhibitors, and uh, uh, they can, uh, with the idea of preventing resistance or treating resistance, and that's something that many groups are now studying. Mm -hmm. 
And would that um, possibly be considered as an adjuvant therapy for, for stage three folks in the future? Um, the MEC inhibitors, I think it would be hard to do that uh, because they have less activity than the BRAF inhibitors. There's a lot of interest in using BRAF inhibitors to prevent uh, relapse of BRAF mutant stage 3 melanoma. I don't know that there's any clinical trial open yet. Uh, but then we have to start thinking, it's, is it worth taking these agents that can have some toxicities by themselves for a year or two when we don't even know if the patient is going to have a relapse, when we know that whenever it's metastatic disease, all of the patients should be able to get, that have a BRAF mutant melanoma, at one point should be able to get BRAF inhibitors. So the studies need to be done. I don't think we can uh, jump into conclusions and saying, I want to start that treatment, because we don't know the consequences of doing that, and that needs to be tested in a, in a randomized trial. You know, well, you have such a, a desperate need, though, for an adjuvant therapy for stage three, so it certainly would be a good consideration if that's a possibility. Um, Agree. Along those lines, um, what was I going to ask? Oh, when um, the BRAF is um, potentially going to be approved by the FDA um, in the near future, do you? Do you know if that's going to be restricted um, to just the positive people and, and not any of the, like if you were BRAF negative and you wanted to give it a whirl, would you be able to, to use it once it's approved by the FDA? Yes, but it would be a terrible idea. So the, the, the bulk of the data that it has been generated in the laboratory is that it's a terrible idea to give a BRAF inhibitor to someone who does not have a BRAF mutation. Because of some complicated biology, whenever you block BRAF with a BRAF inhibitor, there's increased signaling through this pathway uh, in the BRAF wild type cells. Because blocking BRAF allows uh, increased signaling through ARAF and CRAF, which are other similar proteins that the cell has anyway. So it results that in BRAF mutant melanoma, there's decreased cell growth. But in BRAF wild type melanoma, there's increased cell growth by giving this, the, uh, uh, this inhibitor. So it would have the opposite result. It would be feeding the melanoma as opposed to blocking it. That's also likely the way that those squamous cell carcinomas or non-melanoma skin cancers are appearing. They do not have the BRAF mutation. They have other mutations that we're, that we're studying. And when you give the BRAF inhibitor, those tumors grow. So the, the conclusion is nobody should receive a BRAF inhibitor unless there is a BRAF mutation. Okay. Um, on to a different uh, drug. Have you heard of anything about any preliminary results for the E7080 being used by melanoma patients? And uh, all what I can say about that is that uh, I've heard some results from patients, and uh, it's a clinical trial that's ongoing, and we have it open here with uh, with my colleague Bartosz Chimilowski, and we've seen some activity. We need. So whenever we start seeing some activity, we need to know what is the denominator, uh, uh, saying how many patients went on to get occasional patients with, with benefit, how reproducible is that, and what's the degree of the benefit, and is it durable. And all of this, that data is not available. So it is right now an experimental agent for which we have uh, more talk than 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 actual evidence that uh, uh, that's been reported in any in any forum. Will there be anything at ASCO on that? Do you think? And there's, I think there's two E7080 presentations at ASCO. I don't know that e either one of them is gives enough patients that where we can derive data that we then we can discuss with uh, with other patients. Right now. Whenever I offer that, uh, that that option, it's uh, I 
I cannot quote any activity because I don't know. I, 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 there's been no study that has been reported for it. Right. What are your thoughts about choosing to do IL-2 versus your VOI? Um, so IL-2, it's a treatment that uh, is very toxic. It needs to be given in an intensive care unit. Uh, it uh, requires a, a one-week hospital stay and repeating that for up to four courses. Your boy is an outpatient infusion that's given in a, uh, 90 minutes in the clinic. The benefit for both treatments is around a similar percentage of patients with durable responses. Uh, we don't know that they are the same the same patients because there's been patients who did not respond to year boy that responded to high dose interleukin two and patients who respond didn't respond to high dose interleukin two that responded to year boy. Uh, but uh, it's a much harder immune stimulant to give uh, than year boy. So uh, it's uh, it's done in a handful of academic centers that have everything set up to give uh, the high dose interleukin two. We continue to offer it to some patients that are young and have no other treatment options. Uh, it's hardly our first line of therapy. Okay. Now, I mean, I've heard that IL-2 has about a 6% response rate, and your VOI has more like a 20% response rate. But you would find them, them about the same? Uh, well, that's quoting different uh, uh, different parts of the of the studies. So, uh, the overall response rate uh, for year boy it's somewhere between six and fifteen percent. Uh, the overall response rate for interleukin two it's around fifteen percent. The six percent is the patients who have durable responses that are lasting ten twenty years. Hmm. The similar number for year boy it's probably around the same ballpark. Uh, the 20 percent benefit that's quoted for your boy is looking at the survival curves that after one year and comparing the control arm there's a, a 20 percent difference so it's better to be on the year boy uh, arm that difference decreases a little bit when we look at two or three years and it settles at around 10 percent so we can twist the data in different ways the 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 final, uh, the, the, the problem continues to be the same. If I'm facing a patient tomorrow in my clinic and we're talking about this, I have to tell them that these two treatments have the potential of leading to long-term response in metastatic melanoma in a subset of patients. We can discuss it's 20, 10, 15, or 5%, but it's in a subset of patients. And if that's you, that gives a lot of benefit, but the majority of cases that will not happen. Well, then connected to that, are there any reliable lab tests for um, identifying responders to UVOI? Like um, absolute lymphocyte count around week seven is one indicator, and CRP levels are another? And those are uh, general changes that segregate a little bit responders from non-responders, but there's no test that can separate or can predict patients at baseline or while they're receiving the treatment. There's been a lot of research by many groups for the last eight to ten years that uh, a year boy has been in clinical development and tremolimumab, the other set for blocking antibody. There's a lot of data. We have learned a lot from it, but it tells us something about the complexity of this type of treatment. We are stimulating an immune system cell to attack the tumor, and multiple things have to happen, and thousands of genes are involved in the process from stimulating the immune system cell to attacking the tumor and having the tumor respond. So thinking that there's going to be an assay that will predict responses, it's uh, it's very simplistic and it hasn't happened and uh, knowing more about it, you realize that it's probably not going to be easy to develop that kind of assay. But we're trying. Right. And uh, along those lines also, we're trying um, to combine possibly your boy and BRAF or something similar to that 
to extend the BREF, you know, to make one more durable? What what would be your comment about that? What's the most interesting combo? So uh, I, every time I sit down with a patient and we talk about these two types of treatments, and if the patient has a BREF mutation, they say, well, why don't you give me both? You have BREF inhibitors that give very high response rate, but uh, uh, most of them are not durable, and you have your boy that gives a low response rate, but once it happens, it tends to be durable. So put them together, we'll have high response rate that's durable. Right. We don't know that that's going to be the case, but we think it may be the case. What we've done meanwhile is testing, does a BRAF inhibitor cripple the function of lymphocytes? And the answer is no, and there's uh, data provided by my, my laboratory and, another, uh, and a laboratory at Mass General by, uh, by Jen Wargo uh, reporting that there's no detrimental effect on the immune system by giving a CTL4 blocking antibody. The next step is to demonstrate that they're working well together and we've uh, reported on an animal model where that happened. The next step is doing it in the clinic and there's been a long-standing interest by the investigators and also by the companies that have these agents to bring this to the clinic. It hasn't happened yet. There's no clinical trial open yet, but there's one that should be open in the next two or three months that, uh, that test this combination. Wonderful. Okay, well that, that's all the questions I have for you. Um, do you have any further comments you wanted to add? or? Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of this, and uh, I hope it's uh, uh, it, uh, you have all the patients saying that they uh, receive information that's helpful for uh, for their care. I, I think many melanoma uh, uh, clinicians really um, look forward to having well-informed patients because their care ends up being better and uh, the array of possibilities of treatment ends up being uh, being uh, looked further and 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 and, and possible men, uh, uh, drugs that may be benefit are, are better sick. Absolutely. I, we truly believe in that, and that's, you know, truly a mission and for having these webinars. So we really appreciate your time and your wonderful presentation, and it will be archived, and we will have it up in a, in a couple of days if you want to send patients there, and we'll be notifying everybody about that. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, nice evening. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.